morning, folks, and welcome back. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you all. And always good to see all the members back in their chairs. And um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to call the um, meeting of the Civil Law and Data Practices Committee to order uh, for March 10th. And we have a few uh, business housekeeping items to take care of. Um, as part of the interim review, we have correct. Yeah, we have a quorum. For one short? I apologize for my members' tardiness, Madam Chair. That's right. That's okay. Okay. We do have a quorum. Yeah. Yes, we've established that now. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Um, as part of the interim review, we have corrected minutes for the following dates, January 20th, January 27th, February 3rd, February 5th, February 10th, February 12th, February 17th, February 24th, and March 12th. Do I have a motion to approve the corrected minutes? Uh, Madam Chair, so move. Uh, thank you, Representative Lesh. Representative Lesh moves the approve, to approve the corrected minutes. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Passes one to zero. The, uh, those minutes are approved. Uh, now we knew, do need to approve the minutes from our last um, committee hearing for April 21st, 2015. Any discussion on those minutes? Hearing none, um, uh, Representative Hoppy moves the minutes of April 21st. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The uh, minutes from April 21st, 2015 are approved. Uh, folks, I just wanted, to, members, I just wanted to also remi uh, re remind you of uh, the committee rules. I believe they're in the packets, copies of the committee rules, and just wanted to highlight three of those rules. Um, one is that additional meetings may be scheduled at the call of the chair. Uh, secondly, presenters must provide an accessible electronic version of any written materials to be distributed to the committee three hours prior to a hearing unless waived by the chair. And then of course the 24 hour rule, um, all substantive amendments must be received by the committee administrator in writing and electronic format 24 hours prior to the beginning of a scheduled committee hearing. Uh, with that, I believe we're ready. Oh, uh, Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want a clarification. So if, um, you know, I'm say I have a bill that'll be before the committee and I find out that it's gonna be maybe complicated and I decide I wanna do a little handout or something. Um, are we subject to that three hours ahead of time or is it just the presenters that are testifying? Uh, just the presenters. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for ask, asking that clarifying question. Um, all right, folks, um, with that, we're gonna get started. I'm just gonna present um, House File 2602 from the, from the chair here. And uh, so we can get started with that if I can find my notes. Uh, members and members of the public, uh, last fall a news report told Minnesotans about the arrest for burglary of David William Pollard. What was happening is Pollard would sit in the parking lots of such places as the Guthrie Theater, the Chanhassen Theaters, and even funeral homes taking pictures of people's cars as they parked. It was found out that Pollard was subscribing to an online website that allowed him to plug in license plate numbers. Then the program would provide him the name and address of the owner of the vehicle. He would leave the parking lot, drive to their home, and burglarize it. This data is out there because of, mostly because of a federal law that requires our state to provide driver and vehicle information to private entities to do such things as rate, auto insurance and uh, notify people of um, auto recalls. There are 14 permissible uses of motor vehicle data under the United States Code Title 18, Section 2721. The bill that is before us uh, would prohibit any additional, um, would prohibit any individual or entity who lawfully acquires such data from the state from selling or distributing it further, and it requires individuals or entities who want this data to certify in writing that the data would only be used for authorized purposes. 
And any individual or entity found in violation of that would face uh, penalties that are already written in statute, and I believe those range from $1,000 to $15,000 uh, per incident. And I do have one question for staff, and that is, so if is that per name? Could that be uh, a per on a per name basis? So this person that was sitting in these theater parking lots, if he burglarized three homes, would there then be three violations, potentially? If you know the answer to that, Mr. Gearing. Uh, Madam Chair, members, uh, the, the penalty that's in Chapter 13 and 1308 says it's, uh, um, you get potentially exemplary damages of $1,000 to $15,000 per violation. And I think that in this case, if you had multiple individuals who are damaged by the violation, they would each be entitled to, the, to that penalty. So you could have right. okay. several Thank uh, you. penalties. So with that explanation, I would move House File 2602 to be passed and referred to the General Registry. Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like some clarification, um, actually, because I believe entities would cover law enforcement um, and that they would, based on my reading, that it would require um, writ a written document showing that they are only using it for proper purposes. And so there's a couple of examples that I want to just inquire about sure. to see if yep. they would be covered because I want real clarity on um, what it is that we're saying folks can do and can't do. So um, for example, um, we had a murder here where a police officer was murdered and um, there was some dissemination of information about vehicles he previously had driven, about relationships that he previously had. So information was rapidly disseminated amongst multiple law enforcement entities as the um, person who had murdered the police officer was fleeing across the state. So one, I wanna make sure that the entities don't need to have um, a signed release saying that they're not gonna do anything improper with that data because all of that data is, again, vehicle registrations, prior addresses, relationships. And so I wanna make certain that we are not interfering in law enforcement's ability to respond appropriately. Um, another example would be, for example, we found an automobile uh, purchaser or junk dealer who was um, ending up getting an entire large number of vehicles that were stolen mm -hmm. that they were taking to the, uh, cr the car crusher and then the vehicle was being crushed. So once they found these vehicles, they had vehicle information, prior registered owners that they were disseminating out to communities to say, did someone report this car stolen? Is it improper? And so I just wanna make sure that, again, we are limiting the data use and access for people who wanna use it nefariously, but we are not limiting the ability for folks to actually do their job that we want them to do. So could we get some, maybe some clarification from the department as to whether they think law enforcement entities apply to this um, when they're sharing it with other law enforcement communities or if it's just private citizens or private companies or yeah. however that might sure. work, yeah. Madam if, Chair. Is there someone in the audience that wants to take a stab at that? See none. We will turn it over to House staff and see if they have any clarification on that. Mr. Gearing. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, so this section is coded in 13.03, which is the general, <coughs> excuse me, it's the general uh, section of statute that governs the way data are handled in all government entities. Uh, and it does, it does apply to both uh, individuals and entities that are requesting uh, private or non-public data. So I think as drafted right now, um, both private citizens and uh, units of government would be subject to the requirements here. Okay. So is there anybody, I mean, do you have any suggestions on what we could do to tighten that language up to make sure that it doesn't keep our law enforcement from doing their jobs? Uh, Representative Lesh, I guess, has a question. Had a comment? Representative in, in the second paragraph, B, I mean, what, what would restrict a law enforcement agency from being able to uh, certify that any time they request as a blanket certification that it's for an authorized purpose? I mean, why, why would they have to, is there anything saying that they have to do that every single time? Or can you do it once? Yeah, by the way, we do this legally. That's a good, good point. Mr. Gearing? Uh, Madam Chair, yeah, so the way that this is drafted right now, it's not clear what type of uh, written authorization is required. So um, an, an entity could 
potentially interpreted to mean just one uh, authorization document that would apply um, as sort of a contract with other entities, um, or you could read it, I, I think, reasonably as a requirement that you have an authorization each time data is accessed, and that's it, it's really not clear the way the bill is drafted okay. right now. All right, thank you. We will work on scrubbing that um, up a little bit. Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so the the question is, so if I want to broadcast out the information I have as a law enforcement entity to other people to say, please be on the lookout for this stuff, but the people that are hearing it didn't necessarily request to hear it, I am choosing to disseminate it out. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I just am trying to get a sense of how this is going to really work in the in the real world. Right. Um, we want people to use the data as required under the law. I mean, there's no doubt about that. We just want to make sure that the words really um, are clear to those folks who actually do this work. Right. Um, if I happen to hear data that I didn't request because it's broadcast out, because they're maybe trying to locate the vehicle that was involved in uh, that particular homicide, the question then is, did they improperly disseminate the data? Did they not? I mean, it's going to be on a police scanner. It's going to be, you know, potentially picked up on the news. Did they just improperly disseminate that information? And then, for example, when there's like an amber alert, for example, or a missing child, and you are disseminating information about who that maybe either parent or known person is that that took that child and you know their license plate and where they used to work and you're disseminating out that right that information which would normally otherwise not be something you could disseminate <clears throat> again i just want to make sure that this is yeah. right right and so folks this is good discussion and i'm, I'm more than glad to, to lay the bill on the table until we get the right language and um, i do want folks to have a, a, a good level of comfort with this language because it's important to put to put in, into law. And I, I do know um, that the Department of Public Safety, they have quite a um, an agreement that they have these outside entities, these business partners as they call them. They do have quite an in-depth um, agreement that they have them sign that's supposed to protect the data. Now, I don't know in this specific instance um, how old the data was that this individual was tapping into. Some, some reports said that it was probably from 2009 or 10. Um, and so if that's the case, I don't know how fresh these agreements are that DPS has drawn up. They may, they may have just been recently um, drafted in the last couple of years. But um, we, so I think what they have in place now is good protection. And this will put belt and suspenders on it. But we do want to get the right, the right um, language. Representative Johnson, you look like you have a question. Am I a mind reader? You are a <laughs> mind reader. Not more of a question, but a little, little bit of a question or a possible fix to this would be to set this up as for, instead of specifying that it's for private individual use and not government use. That may, that may be the fix. We'll, we'll kind of think through that as well. Any other questions or comments on on this. Anyone else, uh, anyone from the public that wishes to testify um, on this um, bill? I see uh, we have a testifier coming to the table. Welcome to the committee and Mr. Carlson and go ahead and state your name and who you're with and proceed uh, with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Keith Carlson. I'm executive director of the Minnesota Intercounty Association that consists of four suburban counties and 10 greater Minnesota counties with regional centers. Um, while we do support the uh, concept uh, of this bill to subject, subject individuals in the private sector who have access to private or non-public data and that they be subject to the same sanctions that our employees currently are if they uh, utilize this data for purposes other than what is intended, uh, we have substantial concerns with the bill, the way it's drafted. Uh, the issues, frankly, already been uh, discussed and the questions that have occurred here, but I'll specifically reference the language down in paragraph B that starts on lines uh, 1.15 and continues on to 1.16. Um, this would substantially complicate uh, the process of our employees simply doing their jobs, whether that's in child, child protection, uh, child support enforcement, uh, administration of the welfare systems, or simply depositing a check that the uh, governmental entity received. 
All the data that is involved in uh, performance of those functions is includes private data. Uh, checking account uh, information is private data under the law. And what this says without distinction has to whether you're a governmental employee or whether you're a member of the private sector is that you have to certify in writing uh, that the data will not be used uh, for anything other than its authorized purpose. And as Mr. Gearing has indicated, it's not clear from this uh, whether that's on a one-time basis or uh, whether that um, has to occur every time uh, the data uh, uh, is uh, accessed or disseminated. So quite possibly every time a deposit is made of checks that are collected, that um, statement would have to be completed. Uh, possibly it could even have to be done for every check that happens to be deposited. Um, so we have substantial concerns with the way it's drafted. Uh, it's, it could easily be clarified to make it clear that this only applies to individuals uh, in the private sector who are authorized uh, to access uh, this private or non-public data uh, because there's sufficient sa safeguards, uh, we believe, under current law with regards to governmental employees' use of this data. That'll conclude. Be happy to answer any questions. Any questions from members? Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so just based on your testimony, I'm trying to get a sense. So, so I'm working on a criminal case, and I find out that, you know, maybe there was meth in the presence of a child, and I want to turn over private information that's not yet been made public through the court process to child protection. So then would I need to notify the law enforcement agency that I got that data from, that I was going to make an additional child protection um, report or that I was going to call someone else within the government or maybe I find out that there's some welfare fraud going on um, and I want someone to investigate that. If I'm gonna pass the information from law enforcement that I receive, who do I have to tell and who do I have to give writing to because I'm gonna be disseminating information that I've received from somebody else who provided me with, at this moment, private data. Um, Madam Chair, um, Representative Hillstrom, I believe uh, under the language, again, down on lines 1.15116, uh, the employee who accesses the data has to pr provide that written statement um, and quite potentially, again, the uh, separate entity that subsequently receives that data, uh, using your example, for example, um, a police uh, department investigates a report of child abuse. Uh, they are required to um, cooperate and share that information with the social service agency in that uh, area. Um, quite possibly uh, under this bill, the police officer that has a duty to provide that information to um, the social service agency would have to sign the statement. And then the social service uh, employee would also have to sign that statement um, in you know, doing his or her job and responding to that report of abuse or neglect. So there are mo possible multiple certifications that would have to occur under this uh, bill as written. Representative Hillstrom, follow up. Thank you for your willingness to lay this over and yeah. let's work on it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And part of the issue is, you know, it was the first bill out of the chute and there wasn't enough time really to, after notification for people to hook up with us and um, get the changes made ahead of time so I could have brought a DE amendment. But um, anyway, we will be working on that. Any other questions from members? Seeing none, um, uh, where's my language? Um, do I have to move? Okay, so um, I'd like to move that we uh, lay House Bill 2602 on the table and come back to it at a later date. All those in favor, please say, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. House Bill 1602 will be laid on the table. Um, Representative Smith is up next. He has a couple of bills. We'll take up House File 2515 first. Madam Chair, I'm trying to start a new tradition today. Oh, so, go ahead. Um, I offer these uh, donuts in uh, support of that. Wonderful, wonderful. It, it sounds like a new tradition. Um, I hope everybody else is taking note. <laughs> Thank you for your generosity, Representative Smith. 
Um, go ahead, and if you'd like to move your bill, um, that would be fine. Go ahead. Madam Chair, I move House File 2515 before this committee. Um, House File 2515 has been moved before the committee, um, and Representative Smith uh, recommends that the bill be referred to the Committee on Public Safety and Crime Prevention. Uh, Representative Smith, go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment to start out with. I move Amendment A1, which provides some uh, changes to get this bill in the form that uh, the author would like. Very good. Um, all those in favor of adopting the A1, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The A1 is before us. Go ahead, Representative Smith. Thank you. Madam Chair, members, House File 2515 provides some changes uh, to the uh, probate code. Um, in summary, it makes some inflationary adjustments and also some trust code compliance languages from the 2015 session law uh, for that trust code. I have a testifier and I would like uh, that person to speak, please. Uh, very, very well then. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name and your title before uh, the committee and go ahead with your testimony, please. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Jason Schuler. I am a lawyer and senior vice president at Bell State Bank and Trust. I'm also uh, co-chair of the uh, State Bar Association's Probate uh, and Trust Legislative Committee. And our uh, committee has worked on this bill for the last year. Uh, we uh, took a look at updates that the Uniform Law Commission has uh, updated on the, the Uniform Probate Code and then updated numbers within, uh, within our current Minnesota Probate Code. Uh, through our committee has reviewed this, uh, the bill thoroughly. We've also had other sections uh, within the Bar Association review it, including the property uh, section as well and the elder law section. We haven't received uh, any opposition to the bill. And uh, I'd just like to quickly summarize uh, five key points uh, sure, within the bill, if that's okay. Thank mm -hmm. you, Madam Chair. Um, I think one, one of the most important uh, uh, factors that we've, we've done is take a, take a look at the, uh, the family allowance, uh, and this is the amount of money that uh, is distributed out to a family uh, after a loved one has passed away and their assets are going through probate. We've increased the family allowance from $1,500 a month to $2,300 a month. This doesn't sound like a lot of money, but to a family living on the edge, this, can, this $800 could help significantly. We've also added some definitions such as governing instrument. The term governing instrument is used 14 times throughout the uh, Uniform Probate Code. We had no definition uh, before now. Um, things that would, would qualify as a governing instrument would be a deed or a trust, a will, insurance or annuity policy. Uh, we've also expanded uh, protections for beneficiaries of a revocable trust uh, from being cut out of a specific gift of property if the trustee is required to sell that property while uh, the person who created the, the trust is incapacitated. We make sure that uh, the person who should have received the gift gets the proceeds from the sale of that, uh, that asset. And uh, then finally, we, we also added uh, to the, the uh, code a section that allows people to go in uh, uh, and make correct uh, correct mistakes uh, in a document. If that's needed, the court has to authorize it. Very good. Thank you for that information. Uh, Thank member you. questions for this testifier. Representative Hilster. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a couple of questions. Um, when did you deal with um, digital assets? Um, and now that as people are passing, they have digital assets that they either need to pass on or not? Yes, we have, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, we have a committee that uh, is reviewing uh, digital assets and working on a, a bill to uh, uh, have passed. Uh, we did not include that in this, this bill at this time. Madam Chair. Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Under um, 15, the general powers and duties of a conservator, allowing a conservator to speci um, to sp um, initiate and represent a ward in all civil court um, proceedings. Um, is that really letting the uh, conservator now practice law without a license? Mr. Schuller. Madam Chair, no, the, uh, the conservator would be represented uh, by counsel. 
uh, before the court as they represent their uh, ward. Madam Chair. Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. So is that required? So they couldn't act pro se on any of these matters on behalf of their ward? Mr. Schuller. Uh, I would have to get back to you on, on that, Representative. That's, that's a pretty important piece for okay. me. Um, and then one one last question that I have. Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, one of the powers that um, were granted, I think, in the last legislative session, that um, is that it allows um, guardians and conservators to have some um, power to actually modify or change the will or trust. Um, and I prosecute people who steal money from vulnerable adults who are sometimes wards or um, or who are um, sometimes conservators or um, guardians. And so my question is, does this make it easier for people who want to um, actually do nefarious things to not be caught in these uh, gr more granted powers? Or do you have some protections built in so that someone's going to notice or someone's going to have the opportunity to catch um, when someone's using that power to um, maybe steal all their money or abuse or neglect the vulnerable Mr. Schiller. person? Madam Chair, um, anytime someone wishes to either create an estate plan or amend a document uh, for a ward, a conservator, uh, if a conservator wanted to do that, they would need to uh, petition the court and the court would need to authorize those changes. So this does not make it any easier. Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. So it does not include powers of attorney, just court appointed guardians or conservators for this piece? Mr. Schuller. Madam Chair, uh, this piece uh, is specifically, uh, our, our amendment is to uh, add trustees. I think that the current law uh, includes uh, conservators, guardians, as well as power, uh, agents under a power of attorney. We're not making changes to the, that, uh, that portion of the bill. Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. So you're going to allow trustees to make this change, and that's the only change that you're making? Is that what you testified to? I'm just trying to get some real clarity here, actually on the record, so that you know if something goes wrong, we know where to go back and pinpoint to what specific language caused the pieces to go wrong. Mr. Schuller, take your time if you're looking through the bill. Thank you. <laughs> And just a reminder, too, that this bill is going to public safety and judiciary um, next, and if there needs to be some language tightening, we can do it between here and there. Okay, thank you. So, oh, Madam Chair, if I could just, I'm going to, yep, I'm going to throw my life in here, Madam okay. Chair. Yeah, could you right. you so, so if you could actually, between now and the next committee, get me that information. Gladly. And if it's not clear, um, maybe we, we can work on getting some language, but I'm very concerned about when we put people in uh, positions of authority, right, over other people's monies or estates, that we make sure that there are the proper checks and balances to make sure that if someone is using the money for nefarious reasons or for abuse and neglect, um, that there's a way for people to catch it. So whether it's court review that has to approve it or whatever, I just want to make sure that those proper protections are in place. Mr. Schiller? Madam Chair, yes, that we, uh, we have not taken away any protections in this bill, but I will get back to you with the information you're requesting. And members, uh, Ms. Mullen has a few comments on this. I think she'd like to enlighten us maybe a little bit. Thank you, Chair and Representatives. Uh, if Representative Hillstrom, I think you're referring to Section 14 and 15 related to initiating a lawsuit. Is that correct for the speed? Okay. So the, the first one expands duties under the general powers and duties of a guardian. And in Section 15, it expands the duties under the general powers and duties of a conservator. So only the conservator and a guardian in those court-appointed guardianship and conservatorship cases would be affected by this. And so powers of attorney and trustees would not be affected. So the, the powers are expanded. The, the other thing you might, um, you could look at as far as like potentially, if, if you think it needs a fix, but this goes under paragraph C in the conservatorship and in the guardianship it's similarly drafted. So these are duties that guardians and conservators have, but the court will, um, they can amend those duties 
in how they draft the court order. So if it was a case where they didn't think it would be appropriate for a person to be able to do these things, they would note that in the court order that they wouldn't be able to initiate a lawsuit or, or, or what have you. So you're still subject to whatever is in your court ordered for, for your guardianship or your, or your conservatorship. But this clarifies that, the, that this is a duty that can be, that can occur. Madam Chair. Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Many of these cases are not contested, right? They're not contested cases, and so no one's coming to say, no, I don't think that that person should um, be the guardian or the conservator, and I don't think that there's any reason not to give them the full panoply of options. And so what I want to make sure that is that in these majority of cases which are non-contested, that we are not giving this broad range of um, ability for someone to get um, unchecked access to people's assets and their, um, for example, there is nothing in here that says that they can't use it to sue another person who maybe is a beneficiary in the will or in the estate, right? I mean, if you're going to have a, a, a lawsuit, then you can use that vulnerable person's money to wage whatever kind of lawsuits that you so chose under that power. Again, if it's not a contested case and no one's really watching or paying attention. I mean, in the last round of audits that the court did to look at these conservatorships and guardianships, um, they actually found four cases where a court-appointed guardian was doing criminal activity that has now resulted in criminal charges. And so I just want to make sure that we're not just broadly um, allowing people to do things without someone watching. I'm not necessarily opposed to them having this authority as long as that authority has got some checks and balances. Absolutely. Very good. Mr. Schiller, do you have a comment on Madam that? Madam Chair, in, in this case, the, the court would be um, watching what the conservator or the, the, uh, the guardian is doing. And the, um, as soon as the, the ward passes away, the power as conservator or guardian uh, passes with that person. And so they no longer would have authority. So if there is a, a will or trust that has been created, uh, whoever is named as trustee or personal representative in the will, uh, that's the person who would have power to administer the estate. And uh, then they uh, would either fall under the, the court uh, supervision or under, uh, well, it'd be court supervision either way. Thank you, Representative Hilstrom. Any follow up on that? I think we'll just. Work, work on it. On it. Okay. Sounds great. Sounds great. Any other member questions? Anyone else in the audience wishing to testify on House File 2515? Seeing none, um, Representative Smith renews his motion that House File 2515 be re referred or re referred to the Committee on Public Safety and Crime Prevention. All those in favor, please say A. A. Aye. All those opposed, nay. The bill is on its way to public safety, and I'm sure, um, Representative Smith, any, any follow-up comments, I guess I should, okay, I'm sure that um, we'll address those issues between here and public safety. Thank you for your time for being Thank here. You. Thank you. Representative Smith has um, another bill. Representative Smith, would you like to move House File 2294? Yes, Madam Chair, I move House File 2294 uh, before this committee. Very good. Um, all those in favor, no, wait. Okay. Representative Smith, go ahead with your um, explanation of the bill. And if you have testifiers, uh, we can go ahead with that too. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, oh, we have a House handout that's coming, folks. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, House File 2294 um, deals with the eliminating the wait period of five days to attain a marriage license. Uh, currently, Minnesota is one of two states left in the country with this long of a wait period. It has turned out to be non-consumer friendly and a burdensome to the court. Um, and this bill would take the wait period down to zero days. And I have a testifier to add some additional language to the testimony. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome Good to morning. the committee. And please introduce yourself for the tape and go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Scott. My name is Mark Chapin. I work for Hennepin County and my role there is I'm the county auditor, the treasurer, and I'm director of licensing. So I'm here today to support uh, this bill, House File 2294, and I'll keep my testimony very short. Uh, I want to couple, couple, cover a couple of things. 
First, the purpose of the legislation, as the representative indicated, is to eliminate the requirement of a five-day waiting period. Currently, the local registrar, which in Hennepin County, and I think it's true of most of the counties in the state, um, provides a license to a couple who is seeking to be married. The law currently requires a five-day waiting period. Under the proposal, that would be eliminated in all other provisions in the law, other than the judicial waiver, which wouldn't be required, would remain the same. So Chapter 517 would remain the same, other than elimination of the five days that the clerk would have to wait before that license could be issued. Nationally, Minnesota is in the minority, as um, uh, Representative uh, has just stated. We do have the longest waiting period. We're tied with Wisconsin at five days. In Wisconsin recently, they amended their statute that if you pay a $25 fee, you don't have to wait. But Minnesota uh, currently is the longest. Uh, eliminating the waiting period would bring Minnesota in line with the majority of states. And the little sheet that we have uh, indicates the number of states that do have uh, no waiting period. I'm speaking really on behalf of Hennepin County because we do issue the largest number of marriage licenses, uh, more than 9,000 annually. And so we, this is a burden for couples to wait for the, the license to be issued by the clerk. Because even after the license is issued, you still have to find an officiant, two witnesses, and then that marriage ceremony has to occur after examination under oath by the officiant, and then they have to file the marriage certificate. Our customers indicate that the two most frequently cited reasons for why they are asking for a waiver, and this is what they tell the courts, so I'm getting this from the 4th Judicial District, is that first, they didn't know they had to wait. They didn't know there was a law that said they had to wait to get a license. The second reason is they didn't want to wait. They either want to get married that day or in the next few days, um, they wanted some flexibility around it. Those are the two major reasons. Infrequently, there are reasons such as uh, the health of the spouse or a family member, uh, somebody that might be dying, want, and they want a they want a license, they want it more quickly than what the law currently provides. We checked with the Fourth Judicial District, which is the Hennepin County Courts. They've been keeping track for about the last year and a half, and they indicate that uh, they believe about 200 to 300 waiver requests are, are requested annually. And what this means is if an individual wants that license more quickly than the five-day period, they need to go to a judge and they need the judge to sign the waiver. And I know in some jurisdictions that might be fairly easy. For example, in St. Paul, I know you can get your license at the courthouse and you can probably find a judge in the courthouse. In Hennepin, it's a little more challenging. We have six service centers. If you're in Maple Grove, for example, you, and you want your license today, and you apply, you need to come down to the government center, and you gotta find a place to park, which is kinda like over here, it's difficult to find that. Go through weapon screening, find the signing judge who's sitting there signing ex partes for, ex parte orders for you know, domestic cases, harassment cases, get the signature, head back to Maple Grove, and then the clerk can issue that license to that individual, again, it's an exception, but it is, it is burdensome not only on our customers, but it's also a drawdown of the courts. And the courts have asked me informally to bring this to you because um, they've got more pressing matters than signing these waivers. At Hennepin, they've never had an instance where they've denied uh, one of these waivers. I mean, that's always a possibility, but it hasn't been the case. This has been on our books since 1931. We couldn't find in the stenographer's notes from that time as to why the legislature in 1931 thought they should have this uh, provision in the law because it had not existed since uh, that we became a state. Our suspicion is during that time, marriages went down dramatically during the Depression. There was a lot of concern about whether people could support a spouse and whether they could have children. And so it may be that this has something to do with that. I would be speculating in, in suggesting that, but the timing of the law in 1931 makes me wonder if that was part of it. In any event, I'm here today uh, supporting this uh, bill and, and hoping that uh, you will give it favorable consideration, and, and if you've got questions, I'm here to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Chapin. I just want to get on the record, too, um, that this uh, would not allow someone to do a hurry-up wedding where they're where they're not doing checks and balances, where if someone says they're 18 or 19 and they want to get married and they're actually 15 or 16, we're still checking those things out and we're still making sure that no one is already married. Those sorts of things are still happening. 
this is just taking away um, some burden off the court. Any questions? Chair Scott, that's correct. Thank you, Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Representative Scott. I actually am strongly supportive. I just want to make sure that you uh, plan to keep this as a clean bill. I've carried a marriage bill once before, and they <laughs> tend to be fodder for um, people trying to amend them into um, sometimes not really um, anything like the bill they started off as. So is it your intention to keep this marriage bill just this subject? Madam Chair, yes, Representative, Smith. yes. Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my, um, I have a story actually of a, of a waiting period problem. Um, I volunteered for the Homeless Connect project um, where they spend one day, they have all the um, homeless folks come in and they provide them with haircuts and legal advice and help them clear up all sorts of things. And we had a couple that said, we wanna get married in Hennepin County, but we don't have a mailing address. And so when you have to wait five days and you don't have an address, you can't get married. And so I think it's really important that we have the ability for um, everyone who chooses to get married to have that opportunity. So um, I'm strongly supportive of your bill. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Lesh. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm not sure if this is a, a reason to oppose the bill, but I know in there one of the good reasons of why um, we should sort of streamline this and do away with the waiver system is because of people with upcoming military deployments. And let me, let me tell you this, there's not a soul in the United States military who gets deployed on five days notice unless you're special operations, army rangers or, or uh, special forces. Um, and I can tell you, thank God, because I have plenty of privates who have made dumb decisions uh, over the years. Um, and suddenly, um, they, they knew they were getting deployed. And right before deployment, they either get talked into getting married by uh, the, their significant other or talk their significant other into getting married. And it was one of the worst decisions they made. Um, so, because <laughs> you see the impact uh, over the course of mobilization. Um, so I think that actually is a good thing in the case of the military. Um, but to the extent that there's... Uh, already two to 300 uh, waiver requests being granted in Hennepin County as it stands right now. They'll probably find a way to do it if they're gonna, but I just wanted to note that uh, just because there's an upcoming military deployment doesn't mean it's a good reason to, to streamline the system. Madam Chair, Representative, Representative Smith. Um, if I could add to that, the um, of the 250 on average waiver requests just in Hennepin County, we don't have a number for the statewide, um, to our knowledge, zero have ever been denied. So it, is, it really is not, uh, if someone is looking to do that uh, in a quick fashion, this really doesn't aid them in that aspect. Thank you, Representative Smith. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to testify on House File 2294? Seeing no one, um, any closing comments, Representative Smith? Any closing comments? No, Madam Chair. Okay, very good. Representative Smith then renews his motion that House File 2294 be re-referred to the general register. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. The, the motion is, House File, A and nay rhyme. House File uh, 2294, A. Arg. Arg, that's Arg, great. Right. House File 2294 is on its way to the general register. Thank you. Canadian Parliament, What are you going to do, eh? Show next door, you're doing over there, eh? <laughs> I like it. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, folks.